this prayer, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you today to speak to my life. Come on, I want everyone to pray. Say, I ask you today to speak to my life in such a way that I will understand your word, that I will be able to declare your word and do it so it changes my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just give the biggest shout of praise and applause to the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Come on, really lift up a praise to the Lord our God. Amen. 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 And um, we're continuing with a series about being blessed. Ask your neighbor, are you blessed? Now tell your neighbor, I'm blessed, are you? And I want to remind you that when Jesus talks about what it means to be blessed, he doesn't talk the way many in the world, in many even in the church today, are talking about when it comes to blessing. And we read this at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. And it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth. And taught them saying. <clears throat> now listen to what he says. He now begins to tell you what it means to be blessed. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he starts off by saying, Blessed are those who do not see themselves as better than everyone else. Blessed are those who come humbly before God. Blessed are those who don't walk around like they've got all the answers. Blessed are those who recognize their need for God. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Why do we mourn? We mourn over our sin. And I, I want you to think, I mean, there we heard of 55 rand being stolen. And it was not only stolen from the person, it was stolen from the church and it says, when someone comes and they mourn over their sin, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I want you to look at me and I want you to listen. You know, when you get challenged either by Scripture or by someone in the church over your sin, there's one of two reactions. You either get offended. If you get offended, what you're saying is, I want to keep doing that. Or there's mourning. You're sorry. You want to change. You wish you hadn't done it. There are tears. And Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you're really sorry for your sin, if you've really laid your sin down, if you've really laid yourself down, if you really want to change, you will be comforted. The Holy Spirit will comfort you. You will receive forgiveness. Your life will change. Amen. If you believe that, give the Lord the biggest shout of praise. Amen. Amen. And then it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Tell your neighbor, meekness is not weakness. Amen. Blessed are those who are humble. Blessed are those who are willing to go to anyone, who are willing to associate with anyone, who do not see certain people as being beneath, beneath them. Okay, those who are meek, they will inherit the earth. Please just understand, that's a powerful promise there from, from Jesus. Okay, you look in sport. What happens when someone scores? That's the opposite of meek. All right? And that is weakness. Amen? Tell your neighbor, say, standing like this is weakness. Amen? Acting like you've been crucified and you've never been crucified in your life. Don't say it's the devil. Don't say I'm under attack. All right, no, no, you need to be meek. 
And then it says this. This is what Jesus goes on to say. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What do you hunger and thirst for? What is it that you live for? All right, there's some struggling Christians in our church who spoke to me this morning about a soccer team called Manchester City. Full of pride. Full of the opposite of meekness. Pastor, we won. You know what I asked them? Where's Manchester? Can you point Manchester on a map for me? But we won. What do you mean we? You live in Joburg. Who's we? Amen. But people like that, they're not hungry and thirsting for righteousness. They're hungry and thirsting to tell the pastor, you wrong pastor. <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? For they shall be filled. What I've been telling Mr. Malingu, who's laughing there, other side of the curtain, I can't see him, is that, yeah, you can, you can gloat in your victory, but Pep's going to leave one day. You understand? So you will not always be filled. Somewhere you will lose. But those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. Amen? Amen? Come on, tell your neighbor, amen. Come on, say, hey, neighbor, Amen. Amen. And then it says, Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. They shall see God. Blessed are those whose motives are transparent, who are who they say they are. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So if you want to be called a child of God, you need to be a peacemaker. That's what we've been going through for the last period of time. And then it says, the, 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 the best part. Tell the person next to you, say, here comes the best part. The best part. Tell the person next to you, you thought Sashi was hectic. <laughs> Tell them, wait until this one. <laughs> Amen. So this is what it says. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. Not when you are persecuted because you were rude. Not when you are persecuted because you stole someone else's tithe. Not when you are persecuted because you have lied and cheated people. Not you are persecuted because all you cared about was yourself. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you. Now the NLT says, blessed are you when they insult you. Blessed are you when they speak behind your back. Blessed are you with all of these things. Blessed are you when they mock you. When they mock you over your faith, you are blessed. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. The NLT says they lie about you. Tell the person next to you, say, I'm blessed when people lie about me. You know, they were speaking behind my back. I'm so upset. They were speaking behind my back, and it's not even true. Jesus says, good, you're blessed. Tell your neighbor, say, come on. Come on, you're blessed when people talk about you. Amen. Some of you should be giving the Lord the biggest shout of praise right now. Amen. Amen. Just, it's up to you to make sure that when they talk about you, they're lying. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, blessed are you when people are talking about you behind your back and they're telling the truth because that's actually what happened. 
Blessed are you when they lie about you. And he says, for my sake. Blessed are you when they lie about you because they see Jesus in you. Why? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, if you think about all of the Beatitudes, that one is the one that is the most opposite to our human nature. I'm blessed because I'm being persecuted. I'm blessed because people are attacking me. I'm blessed because people are lying about me. I'm blessed when all of these terrible things are happening. Because the world doesn't associate being blessed with things like humility. The world doesn't associate blessing with mourning over sin. The the world doesn't associate blessing with being gentle or being righteous or being merciful or having a pure heart and pure motives. The world doesn't see that as being a blessing. The world doesn't see blessing as being a peacemaker. The world doesn't see blessing as being holy. And it definitely doesn't see blessing as being persecuted. You know, sometimes we talk about the devil. The devil is coming. The devil is attacking. Satan is attacking. In the meantime, we're blessed. And this becomes very, very challenging. But if you can start grabbing your head around this, your life as a Christian is going to go to a whole nother level. A survey was done to find out what is it that makes people happy. What is it that makes people happy? What is it that makes them celebrate? And it was found that people are happy when they enjoy other people to the degree that they benefit from them and they don't have to sacrifice for themselves. You know why many marriages go wrong? Because when you get married, guess what? You have to sacrifice for that person. And people only want other people, friendships, relationships with those people that they don't have to sacrifice for. And that they enjoy being around all the time. Let me tell you, in a marriage you get tested. You know why you get tested? There's no person on the face of the planet that you're always going to enjoy being around. Tell your neighbor, sometime everyone's breath stinks. Amen. They also found that um, people are happy when they refuse to participate in any negative feelings or emotions. Now, don't be so negative. Now, sometimes to get through to victory, you've got to go through the negative. Sometimes you have to deal with the negative. And the negative includes your own sin. Sometimes you have to have a negative reaction of mourning over your sin. And then also that that, that people are happy when they have a sense of accomplishment based on their own self-sufficiency and thus they are independent and in control. Tell your neighbor, say, people like being in control. Tell your neighbor, but they never are. Amen. The Bible teaches that a blessed person is not the person who is self-sufficient. The Bible teaches that a blessed person is not the person that is independent, but the one who recognizes their own emptiness and their own need. The one who comes to God knowing that they have no ability in and of themselves. That is the blessed person. And the Bible teaches us that a blessed person is one that is aware of, of their own inability to attain God's standards and therefore throws himself at the foot of the cross and throws himself at the mercy of Jesus and then passes that mercy on to the people around them. The Bible says that when you have the kind of attitude that brings about mourning over your own sinfulness, you are blessed. The Bible says when that mourning causes you to change, you are blessed. And to be genuinely content, the person, any person must not be self-seeking, but self-sacrificing. 
If you want to be satisfied in life, you need to sacrifice in love. You must be gentle, merciful, pure in heart, yearn for righteousness, and seeking to make peace on God's term, even if these attitudes cause you harm. The person that is blessed will do these things even if it hurts them. So now we get to persecution. And I want you to think about a sobering truth. Those who faithfully live according to the first seven Beatitudes are guaranteed at some point to experience the eighth. I want you to look at me. If you're going to live like Jesus, if you're going to map your life according to the teaching of Jesus, you're inevitably going to be persecuted for it. Because people are going to look at you, they're going to see you, they're going to see your life, and they're going to be freaked out by it. Because you make them feel guilty for themselves. You need to listen to me now. Godliness generates hostility and antagonism from the world. And the crowning feature of being blessed is being a, a, a person who is persecuted for the kingdom. Kingdom people are a rejected people. And that, that becomes a problem if you're afraid of being rejected. And if your all-sufficiency is not in Jesus, you're going to be afraid of being rejected. And the moment you're rejected, you're going to fall apart. And what I want to encourage you with today and to, to challenge you with is that at the end of the day, if you're going to really become a kingdom person, you're going to experience rejection. Just go look at Jesus himself. Go look at all of the 11 apostles other than Judas. They all got rejected. Matthias, we don't know what happened after he was incorporated into the 12, but it, he was probably rejected too. Paul was rejected. They were all rejected. And a holy people are singularly blessed, but they pay a price for it. And so the persecution, the, the last beatitude is two in one. It's a single beatitude that is repeated and expanded. Now the, the word blessed is mentioned twice in verse 10 and 11. And the emphasis is the generous blessing that's given by God to those who are persecuted. So it's almost as if Jesus is saying, listen, if you are persecuted for his name's sake, you are double blessed. Okay, think about that for a second. If you are persecuted for Jesus' name, you are double blessed. Now, I want you all to look at me because some of you are going to be thinking, whoa, what are you saying to me? And let, let me tell you something. You're going to have problems. You're going to have people coming against you anyway. You're going to have people betraying you. You're going to have people doing all sorts of nonsense to you. You may as well be blessed because of it. Come on, if you believe that, give the Lord the biggest shout of praise. Amen. You may as well be blessed. No, no, come on. I want you to really let it out and get excited. Amen. Amen. When people come against you, you may as well be double blessed because of it. And those who have been persecuted are those who live out of the previous seven Beatitudes. And to the degree to which they fulfill the first seven, they may experience the eighth. Now listen to Paul. He's speaking to his disciple Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. He says, yes. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, by the way, you can go and find, there's a number of other verses like this. But he says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You know, for those who live godly, persecution is a promise. One of the promises of God is persecution. And if you're not persecuted, it's because you're not doing anything in the kingdom. I want you to think about what people revere. 
people revere winners in sport. But you know, you can be Manchester City for eternity. If you are Manchester City, even if you were Holland and you scored most of the goals, you know what I'm saying? If you are not getting persecuted for righteousness sake, you are nothing. If you are a CEO of a company, you are nothing. Okay, whatever you are, if you are the richest person in South Africa, you are nothing. Because when you face God one day, He's not going to be impressed with that stuff. He's not going to be impressed with how much wealth you get. If you're not reaching out to raise the fatherless in our nation, if you're not reaching out to, to raise your own children as parents, and as the church to raise the fatherless generation. Then at the end of the day, what are you doing for the Lord? And Timothy is a disciple of, you know, of Paul. And Paul is giving him a practical example of persecution. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 to 17, Paul says this, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I have endured. Out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. I want you to listen to what Paul says. I've experienced all those persecutions, but out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. Tell your neighbor, say, out of all of them, the Lord will deliver me. Amen. Come on, say, out of all of them, the Lord will deliver me. And then he says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learnt and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learnt them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus." All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here's the thing. Money doesn't complete you. Having someone that you're married to doesn't complete you. There's nothing on the earth that completes you. This is what completes you. Being thoroughly equipped for every good work. You will not experience being complete without that. And then he talks about evil people and imposters. Now the evil people and imposters are not the people in the world. He's talking about in the church, you get evil people and imposters. And look at 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 and 13. He says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at what the NLT says, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. If you are deceiving others, you are deceived. The Amplified says it this, but wicked men and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and leading astray others, and being deceived and led astray themselves. Okay, th think about this. He's saying there's a lot of imposters. There's evil people. There's people who pretend to be what they're not. They deceive others and they will, de they, they, they will deceive others and be deceived themselves. And what's the difference between those who are the real deal and the imposters. The real believers are here at church because you desire to live godly in Christ. You desire to be godly in Christ and you know that you need the word of God for this to happen. And I want you to think about that desire to live godly. 2 Timothy 10 verse 10 and but, but you have carefully, listen to what he says to him. He's saying to his disciple, you have carefully followed, say carefully followed. My doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, 
persecutions and afflictions. And, and in the NLT it says, But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I've endured. You know what Paul's saying to Timothy? He's saying, my life has been open and transparent to you. I've discipled you. I've opened up my weaknesses, my strengths. I've opened up everything about myself to you. And I've taught you about where I got my faith from. I taught you about where I get my strength from. And, and let me tell you, if you're not like Paul, then many times you end up with children that are messed up. Maybe you're a cell leader. And many times you end up with disciples that are messed up. Because with your children or your disciples, what happens is you're not open and transparent and so you don't know what's going on in their lives. And so if you're a parent, if you are a disciple maker, do you sit with your kids? Do you sit with your disciples? And Paul says, know this from me. Know what I teach. Know my doctrine. He says, know how I live. My example. The, the manner of my life. The way I live. You know what my purpose is. You know why I'm here. You know what my conviction is. And I want to ask you today, what is your conviction? Many times you see parents... They put everything into their child's education. But if it comes to getting them to youth group or to sell or to something like that, no, no, there isn't time. Whatever your conviction is will determine what you don't have time for. Is your conviction for the things of the world or is your conviction for God? Some parents say, you know what, I'm working hard to, because I want to give my kids everything. And let me tell you, if you have children and you don't give them God, you've given them nothing. If you give them God, they will succeed. Tell your neighbor, if you give your children, if you give your children God, they will succeed. Amen. What is your conviction? What is your conviction about God's house? What is your conviction about getting up and spending time with the Lord? What is your conviction about tithing? What is your conviction about overcoming your sin? What is your conviction about overcoming the maybe addictions or things like that that you have in your life? What is your conviction? What are you convicted by? He says to him, know my faith, my courage. My, I have faith because of my courage. You know this because I've shared it with you. He says, you know my patience. You know where I've been patient. You know my dependence on God. You know that I believe that God is in control. You know that even if all hell is breaking loose around me, my conviction is that God is in control. You know my love. You know my love because you know I'm committed to you being complete. And you know because of my love for you, you can trust me. Because my commitment is to you being complete. He says, you know my endurance, my perseverance, my steadfastness. You know that I'm not a quitter. And you know my persecution and my affliction. If you live like this, you will be persecuted because people are feeling guilty for just being around you. Most people's conviction is, yes, I want the provision of God. I want the provision of God, but I don't want the provider. That's how many in the church are living. And in terms of this, it's not about being perfect. It's about opening your heart to God, being open and transparent. And over time, He will sanctify you. Over time, He will change your life. And if you're not open to God 
it's because you're the God of your own life. And then you're not being discipled. And if you're not being discipled, what that means is no one has the right to say no. Who has the right to say no to you? And when we live like that, we end up in a place where our lives and our kids end up a mess. So we 3C active now. You have to know what it means to be a part of 3C. You have to know what it is I teach. You have to know what it is Pastor Bird teaches. You have to know it. That Paul is saying to Timothy, you know what I teach. And if you don't have this conviction, then anytime you're challenged, you'll be, you, 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 the challenge that you receive will be a problem because you'll freeze. And you won't stand up for what you need to stand up for. And yeah, I want to leave you this last thought. Young people only follow older people that they see that have conviction. And I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And, and while, while, while your eyes are closed, I'm just going to ask if, if we can start handing out the communion. But I, I want you to, right now, to close your eyes and I want you to picture Jesus in front of you he died on the cross for you he died to redeem you from the power of the enemy he died to take you out of the kingdom of darkness and put you into his own kingdom that Jesus can be your king he gave us all the church he gave us the right to be a part of his, of his church. And if we're a part of His church, it means we're His body. As the Bible says, the way He fills everything in every way. And Jesus wants to touch your life. Jesus wants to heal your hurt and your pain. And if the Lord is speaking to you about this, just right where you're standing, just lift up your hands. If you've got your communion, you can just hold it up. You've got a new kind of communion. You've got fancy communion. Amen. I want you to hold it up and say Lord Jesus come I want you to pray after me say Lord Jesus I ask you come on all of you pray say I ask you to come into my heart to show me what it means to be blessed to be really blessed Please forgive me, Lord. For having pushed you aside. Lord, I open my heart to you today. Because I want to be more like you. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. And settle your glory on my head. I also want you to think as we're about to go into a time of communion where you stand with Jesus. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know that if you were to die today and you were to face God tonight in judgment that you'd be okay? And if you don't know that, I want to give you an opportunity in a moment to pray.
And I want to invite you to come forward if that is you. If there's sin that you believe is between you and God, if there's sin that you believe is impossible for God to forgive, I want you to come forward. If you're standing here and you do not know the purpose of God for your life, maybe you feel like there is no purpose for your life. Maybe you feel like your life is a waste of time. Jesus shed his blood to give you purpose. If that's how you feel, I want to encourage you to come forward. If the Lord has spoken to you to recommit your life to him today, then I'm going to invite you to come forward. And I'm going to encourage you to come forward because your eternal destiny is at stake. And so if there's anyone like that right now, I'm going to ask you just to come forward. Come forward right where you are. And I know, I know there are people. So just come forward right now. Just come forward. If you know the person next to you might want to come forward, then you come forward and bring them, bring them with you. Lord Jesus, I just pray for those who you're speaking to right now that they would just come forward in Jesus' name. When you're coming forward, you're saying, Lord, I've realized I can't do this on my own. I just really sense there's some people and there's a spirit over you right now. The Lord's calling you forward and you're not coming. It's almost like I can feel the shackle. And the Lord wants to break the shackle right now. And maybe you're worried about what people will think. And, and I'm gonna, I want to encourage you. People here are not going to think anything bad of you. Because we all need to come before Jesus. Every one of us desperately need Him. But there are a few people here right now. You feel shackled. But the Lord is asking you to come forward so that you can have a breakthrough. And so I just want to encourage you. We've got two that have come forward already. And I know there are others. Just come forward right now. Just come forward right now. I just want to wait a moment or two because I'm just sensing very, very strongly on my heart. The Lord wants you to come forward. There are more that need to come forward. And so far, it's, it's all gentlemen. There's some ladies that need to come forward as well. You're coming forward with your communion. You're coming forward with the sign in your hand that the blood of Jesus was shed for you. And that you can live this life blessed. And when you live your life blessed the way Jesus termed blessed, you realize you've overcome the world. And so there's still one or two others. There's one or two older people. You need to come forward. And we need to have communion, so I can't wait too long, but... You know who you are and the Lord's calling you forward. Just come forward right now. I just really feel it in my spirit. There's one or two older people that need to come forward. And I just feel I need to say to you, the Lord might be saying to you, if you don't come forward today, you will never have this opportunity again. You will never hear this the way I'm speaking to you now again. 
You need to come forward now. And those of you that have come forward, if, if this is you, even if, while we're going to start praying now because I can't wait anymore, but there's one or two that need to come forward. I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. The Lord's busy speaking to you. But I'm going to ask everyone to put your right hand on your heart. And those of you, especially those of you that have come forward, I want you to picture Jesus in your mind. He died on the cross for you and he, he shed his blood for your sin. And his sin is washing you clean. His blood so is washing you clean from your sin right now. And that blood that he shed over 2,000 years ago is ministering to you right now. God is touching you right now. In Jesus' name. I want you to picture Jesus. He loves you so much. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I repent of everything that I've done wrong. I renounce my life of sin. And I accept your sacrifice. And I know that it was the price that you paid for my redemption. And today, Lord, I ask that the blood of your wounded body would heal me from all rebellion, from all sin, from any sickness, from any pain, that you'd set me free from this. And I accept right now that the debt because of my sin has been paid. And there's now a standing balance because you paid everything for me on the cross of Calvary. And I accept that by your blood I am justified and you see me as if I've never sinned and that by your blood I'm sanctified you have chosen me to serve you and I'm willing to serve you and so today I open the door of my heart I invite you to come in as my Lord and my Savior and I thank you for saving me and for giving me eternal life in Jesus name Amen Join the Vault Youth Conference on the 16th to the 17th of June, 2023 at the Moraletta Church in Tswane. Register today on my3c.tv. Join us for our annual It's a Girl Thing Conference on the 8th to the 9th of September, 2023. Hosted by Pastor Sinead Pretorius at the Moraleta Church in Swane, With guest speakers, Pastor Geraldine Bellano, Pastor Johanna Cassianos, Pastor John Jenkins, First Lady Trina Jenkins, and joining us live, Grammy Award winning artist, Cece Wynand. There is a 20% discount for those who register by the end of February. Register today on my3c.tv. 